In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. Okay, everybody's looking at me. I know that I know who's been here and who's not been here for the past couple weeks. So when I start my sermon, I say Christ is in our midst. You say he was, is, and always shall be. So, kein kesti keste. That's what we say, and I explained it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can review the sermon from a couple weeks ago. So, Christ is in our midst. He was, is, and always shall be. Okay, why is that important to say? It's because we acknowledge that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as the Gospels say. Today we hear this Gospel reading of this blind man who is sitting on the side of the road, and the crowd is around him, and Christ is walking down the road, and this blind man says, have mercy upon me. You just hear this man, now think of it. Everybody's probably packing the streets. They're standing there along the roadside. And this blind man is probably just sitting on the ground because he was a beggar. So if you think about the disabilities in the time of Christ, there was no Social Security disability. There was no special benefits. There wasn't hospitals who had special programs or in schools where they had Braille and all these other things. If you had a disability, if you couldn't walk, If you couldn't hear, if you couldn't speak, if you couldn't see, you were done. There was nothing you could really do. There was no job for you, so you sat and you begged. You sat on the roadside and you you hoped for someone to give you some spare change or a piece of food because what were you going to do? And the answer to that is nothing. If you were blind, you couldn't do anything. You just sit there and ask for help. So this man who was in the area, Christ is walking towards the, uh, Jericho and this man is there and he's probably in the background of all these people just lining the streets. Now when Jesus traveled, it wasn't just him by himself, Jesus by himself, but he had his 12 disciples and then there was a group of 70. So really he traveled in larger groups. We always think there was just a couple people, but he at least had 82 people with him most of the time which is where Matthias comes from, the the 13th disciple who replaces Judas. And Matthias was one of the 70. And he was there and he saw everything. So we know that there was this larger group. But then you hear about Christ feeding the 5,000. When we do an Artoclesia service and we have the blessing of the five loaves, we hear that story about the 5,000 that were, were fed. And we know the story of Christ having all these people and, and on the side of the mountain and the, the, this lonely place and he feeds all of them. So we know there was large groups. So just think of Christ coming into Jericho, the streets are lined with people and there's this little poor blind man sitting in the back, probably against a building with his little carpet or whatever he had there, blanket on the floor and his little cup. And he says, Je-, he says what's ha- happening? And they say, Jesus is coming. And he just starts yelling, Jesus, have mercy upon me. And then they say to him, would you quiet down? And why did they tell him to quiet down? Because they thought he wanted money. They thought, well, this guy begs for everything. Maybe he thinks Jesus is loaded. And he's going to come and just help him out and give him all the money he needs. And they told him to be quiet. And what does he do? He yells even louder. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Now it's become even more of a theological understanding. Have mercy upon me. And Jesus stops in the crowd of all these people. He stops and he says, who is it? Bring him here. Bring that man here. Knowing his faith, knowing that this man is calling for Christ to come to him, not to walk to him, but just to have mercy on him. And what does that mean? When we call, we say, Lord, have mercy, over and over. We hear that over and over and over and over in the liturgy. Lord, have mercy. This man is calling it out. And Jesus says, you can just think, in the midst of this crowd, everybody's like, oh, he's going to go, you know, hit up Jesus for some money. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? The man doesn't ask for money. He knows the power of Christ, because we know that no man ever born blind 
before the time of Christ was healed of blindness. In fact, the Gospels are very clear to say that, that Christ was the only one who healed the blind that were born blind. And he says to Christ, the impossible for every generation before and any time that any, any prayers in the church or the temple that they had, he asks Christ for the impossible. Why? Because he knows who Christ is. He may not be able to see, but he knows exactly who he's encountered. And Christ says, what can I do for you? And the man asks a very bold and a very powerful request. Let me have my sight. And Christ says, in, in different ways that it's written, be it done according to your faith. Your faith has made you well. Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Whatever the translation that you want to adhere to or, or find more preferable, we see that Christ says, okay, done. Done. Like that. Snap of the fingers. Because your faith has made you well. It wasn't because of what the man did or didn't do. It wasn't because of any sins. It wasn't because of any disabilities that he had. What he had was blind faith in Christ. Blind faith. He knew who he was. He didn't have to see him. He knew. And how do you know who Christ is? It's in here. It's not here. It's not through our eyes. It's through our heart. And our heart has eyes and the ability to see and the ability to feel. And this man was able to feel and to know who Christ was and hear the stories of him prior to Christ actually coming down the street. And he was listening and he knew that this was the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. And he says, Lord, let me receive my sight. Not Jesus, not oh, oh good one. He says, Lord, let me receive my sight. And he receives it. So we see this transformation from a blind man who was sitting on the street with nothing to being completely healed of his blindness. And then what does he do? He follows Christ. He becomes another follower. And he speaks of the beautiful miracle that he is, that he has become by the grace of Christ, that his blindness was turned into sight. But the only way his blindness was turned into sight was because of his heart. So when you think of your life in the church, we see a lot of different things in the church. We see the icons, we see the walls, we see you know, the, the, the marble, all, all these things, crosses, vestments, all these things. We see it all, and we take it in. But what's happening in here? Are we calling out to Christ to have mercy on us? And what does that mean for our requests? What does it mean? When we say, Lord, have mercy, what are we asking him for mercy concerning our lives? What is it? What are our needs? And when we have faith and we ask God and we say, help me with this because I'm struggling, what father would reject the plea of a child? And what God would we believe in if we said that Christ is not going to listen to us? He's not going to hear me. He's not going to help me. You know, Christ didn't heal every single blind person. He didn't raise every single person from the dead. He gave a taste of what was to come, the beauty of the kingdom of heaven. And in that moment when we come before God in the kingdom of heaven, everything will be restored. The sore back that you walked into church with today, the difficulty hearing that you have today, or the struggles that you have with friends or family or work or whatever it is, all those things are made well in the kingdom of heaven because that is the fullness of the glory of God. So what does he give us here? He gives us a taste of the kingdom of heaven the foreshadowing of the kingdom of heaven. But what this gospel is telling us today is we have to see with this what's in here. We can't just rely on our eyes because our eyes will trick us. And there's many things you can watch on the internet programs and how our eyes deceive us. 
from driving on a dry road and seeing water sitting on the road as a mirage, or those who are in the desert walking and seeing what appears to be water, and it's not there. Our eyes can trick us, but our hearts cannot. But we have to be dialed in to the channel of Christ. We have to understand that we have to open ourselves up and say, who do I believe in? What do I understand? And am I asking God for him to have mercy on me? That is the request that we should be saying all the time. The Jesus prayer, the prayer of the church, the most simple prayer, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Or Kyrie Isu Christe eleison me in Greek. The shortest prayer that, that we see pray, people use with their prayer ropes. This short, powerful prayer is asking God to come to us in every moment of our lives, to transform us, to heal us, and ultimately to save us. So today, in the context of the service, when we say, when we say Lord, have mercy, don't just say it robotically. Say it, Lord, have mercy. When we say for peace in the world and for the salvation of our souls, the salvation, we're asking Christ for the salvation of our souls. What could be more important? And our response should be, Lord, have mercy, save our souls. For the peace in the world, don't we want peace? We want all these things. But we just can't say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord. We have to say, Lord, have mercy. And maybe we don't have to sing it 15 minutes long. I'm not saying about dragging it out. But we have to mean it in here. When you tell someone that you love them, they can tell if you mean it. And when you wish someone well, they can tell if you mean it. So we have to mean what we're saying to God. And this man today meant what he said. Lord, have mercy upon me. Give me sight. Be with me. And what does he do? He leaves everything and follows Christ. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to leave behind the sinfulness, the desires of the world, and we're supposed to follow Christ. So may we all call to him to have mercy upon us. Amen.